Hi everybody, um, thanks for coming along uh, to the engine room stage and um, we're going to have the panel on nutrient management using Digestate now. Um, so my name is Jo Goad and I'm a policy analyst at ADBA and the World Biogas Association. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to this panel and I hope you are too. Um, so as we know, the scope of AD's capabilities is really broad and AD can solve a lot of the crises that we're facing these days. And so the focus of government bodies is increasingly turning to nutrient management, as well as just looking at the carbon potential of anaerobic digestion. Whether it's too much phosphorus in Northern Ireland, too much nitrogen in the River Wye, or not enough phosphorus in Morocco, it seems that having the wrong amount of the wrong nutrient in the wrong place is increasingly becoming an issue that society is having to grapple with. So we know that between two and 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from the artificial fertilizer industry. And research at the University of Cambridge has recently found that with existing technologies, we have the potential to decarbonize 80% of this, um, of the emissions from manures and artificial fertilizers. So, additionally, artificial fertilizer bolsters the fossil fuel industry, which is another issue that we're gonna have to tackle. So, the University of Cambridge also said that between 74 and 75 percent of products from the petrochemical industry are either plastics or artificial fertilizers. So, if the industry, the, art, the, the fossil fuel industry is going to carry on as it is, we're going to have to find additional markets that can counteract this. And I think that Digestate is going to be a serious consideration for markets in the future. So to break, out of this, to break out of this cycle, we need to recycle nutrients wherever we can, wherever we can. And orga organic fertilizers are increasingly being considered an option to do this. In fact, the EU have been calling for farmers to use organic fertilizers as an alternative to artificial fertilizers wherever they can. And since the price spike in artificial fertilizer priced last year, we've seen more and more farmers turning to use organic fertilizer alternatives and even now, when the artificial fertilizer price is going back down, we're finding that a lot more farmers are sticking to using organic fertilizer alternatives. However, if we're gonna push this, we need to make sure that we solve the issues that we face from using organic fertilizers. Whether that be ammonia emissions, runoff, eutrophication, efficiency and yield losses, us as an industry need to make sure that if we're gonna expand the use of digestate, we need to consider these issues and make sure that they're solved. But there are existing technologies and processes out there that can help us do this. So I'm looking forward to hearing from our speakers today who will present options to incorporate Digestate into nutrient management plans. So we have Dr. Karen Tadmore from SG Tech First, Dr. Michael Wilkinson from Stockford, and Dr. Gary Lyons from the Agri-Food and Bioresources Institute speaking today and then we'll have an option for Q&A at the end. So yeah, thank you everybody, and looking forward to passing over to our first speaker. Um, so, hello everyone. Um, and it's great to be here again and to speak about Digestate. Last time we spoke about biogas, so I'm glad that Digestate is the next topic that we want to tackle. Um, so um, thank you for having me here um, among these experts on the Digestate. And I'm Karen Tudmo, head of the microbiome department at SGTech, and we developed a technology um, that treats um, livestock waste in an economical and sustainable manner. So as mentioned before, so Digestate is the other product, the other side of the biogas um, production. Um, it's a liquid filled with nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, and, um, and therefore it is um, used as fertilization. And that is great. Um, it's a great fertilizer. However, um, the fields are oversaturated with nitrogen and phosphorus and therefore there's a need for management of these nutrients. Um, so um, the, 
the fact that we use the digestate reduces the need to use chemical fertilizers, which is also great. But um, there are restrictions that are coming along and, and make us it, makes it unable to use the digestate as fertilizer. Um, and this, these restrictions vary from region to region. And therefore, there's a need for nutrient management so the farmers can use the digestate in a safe and an economical way. So at SGTEC, um, our process um, tries to address these challenges in two ways. On one hand, we produce a digestate that the, most of the nitrogen and the phosphorus are recovered from the liquid phase. So it can be, it can be a valuable um, asset for the farmer. It, ha it provides more um, options for the farmer to be utilized and also produces more biogas so the whole process can be more affordable and economic for the farmer. So um, the way that we re um, reduce and recover the nutrients from the digestate is biologically by anaerobic digestion coupled with aerobic um, digestion, nitrification and denitrification. So this is just a schematic representation of how the process works, the main components. So we have the um, waste going into the anaerobic reactors um, in a sequ sequence batch manner. And then the liquid phase goes on to the next anaerobic reactor. And then the digestate is treated in the, in the um, aerobic reactor. So we have the liquid phase going upstream and out of the system. And the solids are going back to be um, um, to be further digested. Um, this results in um, water that is reduced in nitrogen and reduced in phosphorus and, um, and also more biogas. So th this process, um, although it seems very simple, it's composed of um, multiple steps and um, whoever's doing the job inside are the microbes um, that need to be facilitated and need to be um, accommodated with the best conditions for them to do the, the process in the best way. So um, at SGTEC, we also monitor the operational parameters constantly, the chemical parameters daily, and we also look into the microbes themselves to see that they're all okay and getting whatever they need. So we use uh, molecular biology um, techniques to manage that. So this is um, just a glimpse in the department that I'm managing. So what we do is um, we look at the DNA and the RNA. The DNA is extracted and sequenced, and then we can um, determine the community inside the reactors. We can determine the core microbiome of our process, which microbes are okay inside and which microbes we don't want inside. We have um, microbial indicators. Um, there are microbial indicators in the literature. I'm not sure that they're used um, commercially, but it is really important because we can really pinpoint problems that occur in the process and that weren't detected in any other way. And we also have um, RNA that um, if the DNA tells us who's inside, so the RNA can tell us are they doing their function properly. So we extract the DNA, it kind of gives us like a snapshot of what is going on inside the reactor. We can see a switch on, switch off kind of, of the function. Um, so we can see inside of the nitrification and denitrification since these are very fast processes. So we can see if they're, um, if they're done in the appropriate way that we want them to, um, to go. Um, so uh, just to sum it up, so SGTEC's um, process provides um, bi more biogas and also digestate that is um, reduced in nitrogen up to 80%. Um, most of it is converted into N2 and 60% um, of the phosphorus is recovered from the liquid phase and this is um, compared to a conventional AD processes. So our um, process um, best fits um, farms of cows, piggeries, farms that don't have enough land to spread their digestate farms that want their um, digestate to be managed and to have a more value for what it has and more of an of asset instead of a nuisance. Um, um, and our impact, of course, is to provide a process that is environmentally friendly and economical, that it can um, let the farmers do whatever they do best, um, but also it should be sustainable. Um, so. 
thank you for listening and you can uh, come meet us at um, booth A111 for more questions. Okay. Um, firstly, I just want to say thank you to the team here at Adbert for uh, providing the opportunity to talk. Uh, my name is Michael Wilkinson. I'm the lead technologist with Stockford Limited. Uh, we're a technology company. Uh, I work in the uh, technology and innovation division, and we're looking at uh, sustainable technologies and what can we do basically to make it a more sustainable society. Uh, here today, I want to talk to you about a product that we're, we're looking at uh, called uh, Nutrigy. It's a fertilizer manufactured from uh, from digestate. So um, I suppose, really, what did we set out to do with the Nutritech technology? Uh, we wanted something that was potentially disruptive. Uh, it needed to be economic, environmentally uh, and sustain environmentally sustainable. And uh, basically, we needed to do something to help valorize the digestate that's being produced. Um, in doing that, there's a whole raft of sustainability criteria that get addressed when we start looking at the use of the digestate addressing climate change from improving soil quality um, right the way through to protecting livelihoods, energy security. So there's a lot of uh, benefits to the uh, AD sector valorizing their byproducts. So what, what is Nutrigy? Well, we, we coined this the, the RSCF process. Uh, essentially, we've got a process where we apply chemical amendment techniques and, and thermal processing and physical processing uh, to help retain the nutrients in the digestate, uh, stabilize them effectively. We need to concentrate them up. We're dewatering, changing the speciation of, of those uh, nu nutrients. And that allows us to basically put together uh, different formulations. Importantly, the manufactured material is dry and stable, which helps for uh, storage uh, and use of the, ID, of, sorry, of the AD uh, residues at, the, at different times of the year. Um, just in terms of the performance of these materials, uh, I've got a blend A here which is formulated from uh, food digestate and bioenergy residues. So we put some ashes in this, uh, some, some uh, yeah, very, very, very clean ash, I should say, at this moment in time. Um, these were glass house trials using winter wheat and they were done with Lancaster University. There's uh, four graphs here, essentially above ground biomass, uh, looking at uh, leaf area and looking at the leaf uh, count and it's essentially uh, the, the root shoots uh, they show. The blue bar is the unamended soil, the yellow bar is the soil that we've treated with a standard fertilizer and the grey bar is our nutrigy. And the take home message from this is that when we look at the responses statistically there's no difference between what we're doing with nutrigy and what's actually happening here with standard off-the-shelf fertilizers which is a, a real positive. Uh, that was one blend we used. We also looked at uh, an agri-fiber blend. Uh, no uh, amendments to that in terms of ash or anything, just pure agri-fiber, putting that through our process. Uh, we looked at wheat in this, we looked at oats, and, and again, these were grasshouse trials uh, supported by Lancaster University. We were interested in seeing if there was gonna be a difference in response with these materials uh, due to water stressing. So in the top left-hand uh, image, if you look at the shoot dry weight, uh, the blue bars are the uh, unamended, treats, uh, unamended soils. Uh, again, the yellow bars are the nutri uh, standard urea treatments and our Nutrigy uh, material. So at 100% field capacity for the soil in terms of watering, uh, very little difference, no statistical difference. When we withdrew the water, and went down to 50% of field capacity. We saw a drop in the response of the, uh, the different treatments, but the, the uh, or, or should I say the different parameters, but in terms of the, uh, the treatments between the standard fertilizers and the Nutrigy product, again, very little difference uh, and no statistical difference at all. Similar responses for oats on the bottom on the left-hand side. And when we looked at leaf nutrition, again, very, very little difference 
across the different treatments. So a real positive again, demonstrating that there's real value in the AD material if, if it's used properly. So the next steps for us is to take the, uh, our, our greenhouse trials and, and look at scaling this up and seeing what the responses are in a more real world environment. So Lancaster University again helping us with the mesocosm trials. We've also got field trials in process at a, uh, a red tractor farm over in York. Uh, and we've got winter wheat actually in the ground now and the uh, nutrient addition is happening as we speak and that's mir mirroring the, uh, the farm uh, processes or, or the farm activity. Uh, so we're not, we, tr we tried to mimic the, uh, the real world scenario as much as possible here. Um, what else do we need to do? Well, we need to look at different species. Okay, we've been looking at some grasses. We also need to look at potentially some dicotyledons. We need to look at some brassicas. Uh, I'm very, very interested in some greenhouse crops as well. Uh, and importantly, next steps for us is in terms of partnerships. We need to work with farmers. We can't do this on our own. We need to work with horticulturists. And importantly, we need buy-in from the AD operators. So that's where we're taking this now. Um, has it been straightforward in terms of the challenges we've faced? Contamination. When we look at the uh, food waste digestate, plastic content is a real problem for us. Uh, it's going to be a problem that's going to increase for the sector as time goes on, especially with the move for um, the local authorities to start managing their organic wastes more sustainably. There's a regulatory burden involved in what we're trying to do. We're trying to take a product to market. And we also need to understand a little bit more about the UK fertil fertiliser rates. Um, 2022 EU fertiliser regulations, there doesn't appear to be any clarity yet in terms of whether they're going to be adopted uh, within the UK or whether the UK is going to have a set of standalone rules. So really to summarise, uh, Nutrigy, uh, solving problems. Uh, it's a digestate derived plant nutrition. Uh, it provides an alternative source of sustainable fertilizers, delivers macro and micronutrients to the soil, it provides organic carbon, it helps improve soil quality, it minimizes nutrient leaching, it delivers available and slow release nutrients, and it offers fertilizer uh, cost resilience. And when we start looking at energy prices and the way that that impacts uh, nitrogen manufacturing. So essentially what we have is a high value fertilizer derived from a low value process residue, and we need to maximize the returns on those uh, AD, AD residues. So I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening and for giving your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, hi everybody, uh, my name's Gary Lyons. I work at the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute in Northern Ireland. And today I'm going to talk about environmental challenges and potential solutions for improved digestate nutrient management. I'm going to try and talk about it anyway. There we go. Overview of today's presentation. Um, just going to highlight a couple of environmental challenges involved in digestate usage and management. Very light touch on the important legislation some potential solutions to overcome these challenges, and then a few conclusions. Uh, I developed this really for Northern Ireland and the usage of digestate in Northern Ireland, but the issues are common in certain other parts of the UK, certainly across Europe and definitely other parts of the world. Many of the grassland soils in Northern Ireland are, are way above phosphorus optimum for crop growth and over 90% of the agricultural land is under grass in Northern Ireland, so it's our significant crop. This then leads to phosphorus runoff and water quality issues. Digestates under our Nutrients Action Program are classified as high P manures because of their high phosphorus to nitrogen ratio, and they can only be applied where crop P requirement is proven through soil testing. So on the bottom of the slide there, I have a, a uh, soil P map for Northern Ireland. Ideally, we'd like all of our grass to be sitting in that yellow category, index two, because that's the right amount of phosphorus to grow grass. But you can see a huge amount of our agricultural land is sitting at threes and fours in the phosphorus index map, and that's way above the need, and that's where we're getting the pollution issue from. Big problem is we keep applying organic manures and digestates to these soils. So we need to address these things through better management. 
phosphorus issue around the world, um, the world phosphorus price doubled recently, or probably about a year ago, to over $300 a tonne. That's because of rising energy costs, because of export quotas imposed by China, and of, because of the problems in the Ukraine. A few years ago, we were lucky enough to be involved in the, the Refocus project, which mapped the phosphorus flows into and out of Northern Ireland. And there were a few important outcomes from that. I've only mentioned a few in this slide, but there were quite a few more. We found that 64% of our imported pea is in animal feed because of our big um, animal industry, livestock industry, 24% in inorganic fertilizer. And I would question how much pea and organic fertilizer needs to be used in Northern Ireland. We're, we're still overusing it. Over 7,000 tons of that phosphorus is being applied above crop requirements. And that's significant. Uh, that's coming from manures, digestates, and indeed mineral phosphorus. We can process manures and digestates, and uh, export of excess nutrients then provides us with an opportunity um, to do something about this, to recover those nutrients, and also the potential for further energy production. And of course, we can improve water quality in doing so, and potentially develop some new product streams. Some people may know who Isaac Asimov was. I'm probably older than most of the audience, but he was a biochemist and uh, a very famous science fiction writer. And he came up with this quote in 1974, which I thought was appropriate. We may be able to substitute nuclear power for coal, plastic for wood, yeast for meat, and friendliness for isolation. But for phosphorus, there's neither a substitute nor a replacement. I can't better that, but I attempted a, a Gary Lyons quotation. Phosphorus is not our enemy, but rather a misplaced friend. We just need to manage our relationship better. The second issue I'm going to talk about is ammonia production from digestate. Uh, our environment agency in Northern Ireland see it as an extremely serious issue, but it really is an agricultural issue. It's not just the anaerobic uh, digestion industry. The NH3 emissions from digestate mean we lose valuable nitrogen, and we have these environmental threats to both air quality and protected habitats. So the pie chart on the bottom of the slide shows you the sources of ammonia emissions from uh, agriculture. And then there's a, a phosphorus, uh, sorry, a nitrogen deposition map for Northern Ireland. And the damning uh, information from that is we have huge amounts of nitrogen deposition in protected areas in Northern Ireland that are causing environmental damage. The UK is committed to a 16% reduction of uh, 2005 ammonia levels by 2030, and then further reductions to 2050. The nitrogen deposition critical loads in Northern Ireland ex are exceeded in 98% of uh, priority habitats. Within digestate, we have this chemical equilibrium between the plant available form, ammonium, NH4+, and ammonia, the volatile form, which we lose when we either uh, store the digest, we lose a significant amount of when we store digestate or spread it on the field. And this equilibrium is favored uh, at a higher pH, sorry, is favored for ammonia production, and unfortunately, digestate is a higher pH than slurry and manure, so we tend to lose more ammonia from digestate operations. So we need to reduce that ammonia emitted and, uh, from storage and field application. I don't want to say much about legislation and policies. Most people in the room will know about these. On the top of the slide, we have the various EU directives from which the legislations on the bottom of the slide tend to fall out of. So we've got our nitrates directive, water framework directive, habitats directive, national ceilings emitted, uh, emitting directive, etc. And then from these, and th these are the Northern Ireland policies, but we'll have similar policies in the other jurisdictions in the UK. We have uh, a code for good agricultural practice for loss to water, the same sort of thing for reduction of ammonia issues from agriculture. That third one's our nitrates, uh, nutrients action program, as it's called now, and then we have the digestate quality protocol produced by RAP. The important thing in this slide really is what I've said at the bottom. Legislation in many EU countries is becoming more strict on nutrient over application and nitrogen emissions reduction. And this means that we're, having, we're seeing export or further processing of manures and digestates in those countries. And it's starting to happen here as well. So are there technical solutions for better nutrient and phosphorus management? Yes, there are. That's the good news is we have technologies that are available that can help us to manage these uh, materials. They tend to be biological, chemical, physical, or combinations of these. They typically reduce the water content, recover or separate, and concentrate the plant nutrients. And there's the potential for further renewable energy production from the products. And these can be single technologies right through to variable technology chains. 
and there are a wide range of end, end products available. The graphic I'm showing on the bottom, I'm going to attribute to the systemic project, which was a Horizon 2020 project a couple of years ago that we were involved in. I'm not going to say much about it because Oscar Schumanns, who led the project, will be talking later this afternoon, and he will go into a bit more detail about some of the findings, but very, very useful project. In terms of valorizing or processing digestate, a number of pathways we can look at. Uh, the production of soil improvers and fertilizers is now very important. Um, as mentioned by one of the other speakers, the EU fertilizing products regulations, they're trying to incorporate a lot more organic materials and organic manures and digestates into that to stop the use or to limit the use of chemical fertilizers. We can look at further bioenergy production and also the production of different biomaterials. The first step tends to be in valorization, a mechanical separation process, and I've listed a few there, so you get this thickening and dewatering. We produce a solids fraction and a liquids fraction from that. We can take that solids fraction and dry it and densify it, and in the slide here I'm showing some pelleted material which has been dried, which is the digestate fiber. We can look then at further energy recovery from that in terms of combustion, pyrolysis, gasification, etc. and then there are various products that can come out of that. But the wet material and or the dry material could also be added to composts. Um, if we take the liquid fraction, then the last two portions there look at uh, nutrient stripping and also membrane filtration. And again, there are different technologies here that can strip nutrients out of that liquid fraction if we have to. From the sort of drying intensification and then further energy production, we can end up with two common products. An ash, which is very high in phosphorus, that's exportable or, or can be used as a fertilizer or if we're looking at, say, pyrolysis or gasification, the production of a biochar, which is both carbon and phosphorus rich, and biochars now have many uses, or potential uses. Uh, if we're looking at the liquid fraction, what we tend up with, end up with are mineral concentrates and nitrogen and potassium rich sludges, ammonia water, or ammonium sulfate and ammonium nitrate solutions, all of which are very good fertilizers and commercial value, and have more stabilized forms of nitrogen th that we're not gonna lose as ammonia. And of course, we can go right down to dischargeable water if that, if that is required by the AD plant, depending on the technologies. Nearly there. It's too busy this slide. This is what we do in the AD plant in AFI, but my time's up, so. Conclusions very quickly. We need to be looking at climate smart uh, production with built in environmental safeguards. We all know that. Digestates are an important crop and, and carbon, uh, nutrient crop, nutrient source, and carbon source. We need to optimize the usage and reduce harmful impacts when we're utilizing these materials. The good news is there are technical, technical solutions available to do so. One size does not fit all. That's the important message. Can we add value? We have to add value if we're gonna spend money on processing these. We have to have valuable products at the end, and the bottom one's important as well. We have to keep the regulators happy. So thanks, Adba and WBA for inviting me, and thanks for listening. That was great. Thank you everyone for your presentations. Um, I personally found them really insightful and I hope the audience did too. Um, so we have a bit of time for Q&A now, um, but I'm going to take charge of my powers as chair and take this opportunity to ask the first question. Um, so if you don't mind, Michael, I'd quite like to ask you about what you see being the biggest barriers for digestate in the market as being when compared to artificial fertilizer usage. Um. I, I suppose that there's, there isn't one barrier that, uh, to address this, but if I was to point one out, uh, it would be how, how can we concentrate up those nutrients? So when we look at the application of uh, mineral fertilizers to land, they're very concentrated. Uh, the cost incurred by the landowner in terms of applying them is then minimized. So if we're gonna put something to land which is of a less, of a, of a lower nutrient value, we need to incentivize that some way. So I, I think that's a real uh, issue that needs to be addressed uh, from a legislative point of view in, in the first instance. Uh, how, do, how do we incentivize uh, people to use these products? So I think. Yeah, does anyone have anything they want to add to that? Or no? If not, we'll open the questions to the floor. Has anybody got any questions? We have one down here in the front, if that's all right. There's a mic coming your way. <laughs> Hi, um, good morning. This, my name is Om Narayan, I'm uh, from India, 
we run about six facilities. We generate close to about 100 meter cube of digestate on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, to the panelists, if there is one safe crop or few safe crops where uh, we could use digestate as is coming out of the AD, would you uh, have any of such crops? Um, second, is there is the better way to separate the solids out from the digestate and then use to liquid? What's the best uh, of the two? Anybody want to comment on that? <laughs> you're, you're at the wrong, were you at the last session? No. In here? No, somebody talking about crops, so you missed him. He probably could have answered your question. I don't know what, in India are you talking about? I don't know what the cr best crop to grow in India is to take whole digestate. Um, I can't answer that bit. The second bit about separation. When you separate the solids out, or you'll, not, you'll never separate all of the solids out. You only separate a proportion of them. You end up with a liquid fraction that should percolate better into the soil. Okay, so all of the valuable nitrogen in there, certainly on grassland systems in Northern Ireland, we find we get that nitrogen into the soil quicker, and then it's uptake by the crop quicker. So we don't lose too much volatile nitrogen from that. Um, the best crop, I don't know much ab about the, the crop end of it, the agronomy end of it, but it'll depend on weather, climate, soil type, etc. Any other questions? We've got one back here. Hi, um, I'm Maggie Arias from North Tecasi in the north of Spain. Um, I wanted to ask about the process of neutrality. Uh, what sort of process is it, is it to, to create that organic fertilizer? Um, do you need to add additives? Do you need to add uh, other waste streams or, or other streams from other processes? How, how do you go about producing the, the organic fertilizer? Uh, I think in the first instance, um, I can't give too much information about the process itself. Um, there are certain feedstocks in the AD process that give you uh, a higher concentration of nutrients. Um, food digesting typ typically would have a higher general uh, nutrient content than uh, an agri-fiber. Um, so that would be our, our first go-to uh, product. But in terms of handling that and managing that, there are a lot of processing of that material in, in the first instance. Whereas when you look at the agri-fiber, it might be a lower nutrient content, but the processing of it is actually less in our process. So we have to, 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 to kind of marry the two of those up. Uh, I personally believe that actually we need to start blending these materials. We need to find uh, more efficient ways of concentrating up the nutrients. Uh, at the minute we have a product where we're getting to around about 10% uh, nitrogen. Uh, I think 11% was what we got to. Um, and, and getting that when you start comparing that with uh, standard fertilizers, uh, th there's a real issue there in terms of 30% nitrogen in, in, in those materials and w costs incurred for that. So in terms of the, the processing and how do we maximize the returns, uh, it's not a straightforward question to, to, to answer. There's a lot of considerations, depends very much on the crop type. If we're talking about grasses, is, is that the best place for it to go? Should we be looking at smaller niche markets for these materials. Uh, personally, I think that's where we need to be looking rather than just spreading the material to land and hoping for the best. Uh, there are other options here in terms of greenhouse crops, uh, fruit trees, etc., which we need to start investigating on, on a, more, uh, a more realistic basis. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, we got one over there. Uh, yes, thank you. All the focus so far has been on maximizing nutrient content uh, with almost no reference to actual organic matter content and the potential to boost organic matter, which is something that could become increasingly important under SFI. Uh, and I wonder how you square that circle of inc increased processing is actually going to reduce the actual organic content. No, I, I think that's a very valid point. Um, there is carbon going to the soil in the nutrient process. Um, we are, are, are we're, we're never going to recover, as we said before, we're never going to recover 
or of the carbon material there, we're going to lose some of that material. Uh, at the minute, um, there are definite benefits, obviously, for, for the, the carbon going to soil. Don't need to, don't need to go into those. Uh, but in terms of squaring that, um, it may well be that, you know, we've, we've got to be careful that we don't add the organic material or dilute it and, and have an incurred cost then to the person who's spreading the material to land. So there's a balancing act is what I'm saying. So we just need to, to find out the best way forward for that. In answer to your question, I'm not quite sure how we square that. This might be a good time to raise the issue of biochar. <laughs> um, Gary, I was wondering if you wanted to share any of your thoughts on biochar and the potential role that that might play in carbon sequestration in soils. So yeah, the, the reapplication of biochar back to the soils from that solid fraction processing, you're not, strictly speaking, put organic matter in, but you're putting carbon back into the soil, but that carbon should be fairly well locked up. So um, that doesn't answer your question, and it is a very good question. Um, we, we have a project running on biochar, so I'll answer Joe's question, um, where we're looking at the production of biochar from separated digestate solids, so the fibrous component. Um, and we're looking at a, a number of potential options for using that biochar. One of them is back into soil to grow cereal crops on. Um, Another one is to put those back in the biochar back into the AD process. So we have a laboratory scale setup uh, where we're running experiments and we're seeing an increase in biogas yield. Uh, we're also seeing a decrease in biogas yield if we oversupply the biochar. It has a negative impact. Um, it's not new work. Other people have done this before. But anyway, the, the, um, they tend to have done it with woody biochars. We're doing it with these digestive derived biochars. Um, the other thing we see in anaerobic digestion is peak gas production is t tends to be two to three days earlier with when we add biochar, and that could be very significant for industry, never mind the increase in biogas yield. It's a, mo it's a modest increase between sort of 10 and 12% in biogas yield. We've also looked at using it as a cover for stored slurry to reduce ammonia emissions, and we get a huge, over 30, I think it's 35% reduction in ammonia emissions from stored slurry and some experimentation we've done, and also as a filtration system for landfill leachate. And we're getting good results. We're taking a lot of the lasties out of the landfill leachate that are being absorbed onto the biochar. It has great carbon sequestration potential, carbon capture and storage. Um, again, most people know about that. And in the future, yeah, we're going to see a lot more talk about biochar and, and its uses. Thanks. So I have a question for Karen as well, if that's all right. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about the role of sampling in your process. Um, so how often would you say you have to sample the digestate to keep it stable and ensure that it's safe for use? Um, <clears throat> so in our process, um, in our plant, we, we monitor very often to see, um, to see the, the changes in the process. Since our process is coupled, so it's, it really matters what comes out in the end because some of it is circled back. So it, it, we really need to know um, what comes out in the end of the process. So I would say that um, on a good running um, process, we should, um, we should measure it like in the end of the process if our process is um, 18 days. So that's when we should start in the beginning and in the end before we apply. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's <laughs> yeah, uh, but the microbial sampling should be inside the process, not of the, what comes out, that's already too late. Um, and regarding the biochar, so that is something that's very interesting, micro microbially, <laughs> um, because, um, yeah, very good, we're, we're looking into that. So <laughs> That's really pretty interesting. Um, we've got another question just at the back over here, if we could get the microphone over there. Thank you. Um, Harry Mihalagakis from the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero. From our sort of informal talks in Intel, we our understanding, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, is that AD um, plants on farms tend to view digestate as more useful, whereas bigger plants tend to view it more as a cost. Happy to be corrected on this. What I'd like to know, particularly from Karen and Michael, is what is your, how do people receive your technologies for upgrading, digested, and converting into fertilizers, or specifically AD plant operators? 
Yeah, thanks very much. Um, the limited activity that we've had uh, speaking to AD operators, um, we're very interested. Obviously, there's the potential uh, market at the back end of their process. Uh, so we're very, very interested in, in, in what we're doing. Um, I, I, I do think there's, we need to do more. Uh, we need to have that engagement. That we, we can't go ahead and bring something to market on a perceived uh, or, or on our perception of what the problem is and we're addressing. We need to understand that. We need to understand the problems that the AD sector is facing in the first instance uh, and the problems that the farmers are facing and what the implications are. So that's why I've got a call out basically for those uh, those partnerships. But we need to have that. You know, it needs to be across all sectors involved in this. So um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Karen, do you want to have a go? Um, from our perspective, I think the um, uh, the the engagement is kind of a. a very specific per plant or farm. Each plant or farm has their own solution, what they were doing till now, and do they want to make it better or they can be um, continue to do what they're doing right now um, without interference. So um, I think that the now that there are more restrictions on what you can and cannot do with digestate, so it's becoming um, farmers are uh, contacting us um, to get a better solution, um, but it needs to be a solution that is uh, also coming from the regulation side and pushed from there, and also need to be better technologies that can provide a stable digestate for the farmers to actually implement in their fields. Um, so right now, I guess the um, reactions from the market are very um, region specific. <laughs> Um, and I think that there should be uh, maybe more awareness of technologies that can treat the digestate better. Anything to add to that, Gary? Or uh, no, I, I totally agree with, with my co-speakers. And yeah, the big AD plants see it as a problem because it's a volume problem. It's a very dilute nutrient source, and this has already been mentioned. If you start to process that and concentrate those nutrients, then you have value streams coming out the end where the AD plant can actually sell these and make money. So that's what's going to make the difference, the technologies that these guys are talking about and the other technologies that are out there. They're just not well implemented at the moment, but they will be in the future. Great, we've got a few more minutes, so any final questions? Anyone? We've got one down here. Hello. Um, thank you for your, your talks. I uh, very much enjoyed them and uh, certainly agree with the, the need to uh, better capture AD digestate as a value product, to concentrate up uh, the NMP and, and put it where we need it rather than where we don't. Um, it, it feels as though we take one step forward uh, and then we sort of find other issues along the way. And, and obviously we're somewhat lagging in terms of the legislation. Um, and uh, it, particularly with regards to the, the ammonia side, um, it, it's quite frustrating because I can completely see where you're hoping to go and what you're hoping to do. Uh, and I guess the emerging issues, things like nitrous oxide, and when you're putting it in the case of Karen, I guess you've got an issue going into the aerobic with a high nitrogen by ammonia in an aerobic process. In the case of putting it into the soils, we have potentially nitrous oxide released from the soils. And, and, um, and I guess all of these things, all of these technologies have some advantages in, in some particular site-specific settings and some may be more appropriate in other settings. And, and it would be really good to see with, with the Gary's sort of approach to try and find those approaches that are most appropriate for where it. Uh, and perhaps have some, some leadership, because some of the things like the end of waste, I saw, Michael, on your, your point there, uh, it would be really nice if we could have some clarity on how these new products, so rather than treating them as a waste, there is a product, uh, and have some clarity from the legislation so that operators know how they can use them and where they're appropriate. Yeah, completely agree, and thank you for your comment. Just wondered if anybody wanted to add to that on the panel. 
I think, uh, I know we're out of the EU now, but there are countries within Europe who have proper regulations around these things and they don't treat a lot of these materials as waste anymore. They see the fertilizer value in them. So, yeah, the legislation here needs to, to look at what's happened in other European jurisdictions and uh, to see the value. I do agree as well that we may be pollution swapping with some of these technologies. We may sort out the ammonia problem to create a bigger nitrous oxide problem and that needs to be addressed through processing as well if it can, so it can't be ignored. You know, ammonia is pretty bad, but if we start to produce potent greenhouse gas that we wouldn't have produced, that's equally as bad, if not worse. Just one thing I'd like to add to that as well. Um, at ADVA, we are reviewing the ADPP at the moment. So part of that is obviously looking at the end of waste criteria. And we're working very closely with the Environment Agency and DEFRA, and they have always said to us that if we come to them with sufficient information that different products are usable, that they can review them and consider including them with their end of waste criteria. Um, so I think if you have any research or any evidence that you'd like to bring to us that we can translate into that, the process is very much live at the moment. So send me an email. <laughs> Great. OK, so I think we're about out of time there. But thank you to my panel. I thought that was a really good discussion, really interesting. And thanks to everyone in the audience for asking some great questions and listening. So have a good rest of your day.